Two Chaps, Many Cultures, Episode 70. You going abroad? Do you speak the language? We talked about this before. Of course you should. However, today's guest will tell us a lot of companies don't think about this. And we're going to here to find out why. Why is nobody thinking about this? Stay tuned. <laughs> Well, hello. Well, hello. Happy Friday to you. Uh, happy so, how have you been? How was your week, Brett? It's fantastic. It's still fantastic. It's not over. It's only just <laughs> the beginning. It's only just the beginning. <laughs> the beginning of a wonderful weekend, maybe. Absolutely. So, I teased it a little bit because we talked about language, foreign language acquisition here before amongst the two of us. And when we did, um, we agreed that it would be smart to have somebody here who does this for a living to bring people who work in a global environment up to par or at least up to speed when it comes to speaking the language of a host culture or of a nation slash culture maybe uh, that you're spending most of your work time with. And Let's let's hear her because I think the the one the one thing I gave away in the intro is that too many companies make this an afterthought. They don't plan this strategically. And with us today is Micah, who runs a language learning company in Dallas, Texas, and she can tell us how this stuff ought to work. Welcome <laughs> to Two Chaps Many Cultures, Micah. How are Morning. you? Very well, thanks. And I deliberately did not pronounce your last name because we did this before and I've screwed it up. So I'm going to let you do it. <laughs> Bell, you. Ah. There <laughs> we go. Bell. You're not the only one who avoids my last name. It's perfectly all right. <laughs> now, now, you. you just gave us a great example of how you visualize language learning. So <laughs> you gave us... A little cue here is is this how is this a method that has been tested and is trusted absolutely yes absolutely in our kids classes we always say you have to have some kind of emotion to everything you say and so you have to connect it mm -hmm. so tell tell our audience what what your company fluency corp does so you you train kids and adults and what's the distinction and how does this work Absolutely. Um, so we work with global corporations that are moving their employees and the employees often have families to other countries. And so when those families get moved to another country, um, oftentimes they do not know the language or they have a beginner or low intermediate level of the language. And so to be able to have a successful relocation, one would, um, hope they can fit in, assimilate, have a nice life there and be able to make friends. And of course, for the company, work successfully, right? Right. And in your experience, because we, you and I, we had this conversation many times over, in your experience, how serious do employers take the language gap? Do they strategically approach this or is this often more an afterthought? Oops. Uh, John Smith doesn't speak Spanish. We got to do something about it. I believe oftentimes it is an afterthought, although, you know, we do have um, a handful of clients that make it a priority. And I think it's really interesting how successful they are <laughs> in the new countries. Um, we have some clients that say everyone in the company gets to take private language lessons for wherever they're going. And then the people in the country where they're opening that new branch gets to take, because it's a Spanish company, 
gets to take Spanish lessons to be able to relate to their employer better. So they take mm. it to a whole new level. <laughs> and then we have some others that will say, oh yeah, we're moving this family to Russia next week. Maybe we should start Russian lessons. <laughs> and that, that can be a little frustrating because I want to prep them, you know, Global Fluency Corp wants to prep them starting a year in advance and they knew they were going, you know? <laughs> mm. So that, that would have been my next question. What would be the ideal time frame when when would you ideally begin with language instruction when you know you're about to embark on a on a foreign assignment i actually think that is the biggest challenge for the corporations it's not that they're putting language last on the list i think it's that most of them have about five to six months lead time on on getting these assignments and moving and you know when you have kids and You have a spouse that is saying maybe, what about my job? How am I going to work in Russia, for example? Um, and how are the kids? Where are they going to go to school? And how are they going to come back to school in five years? I think those are such pressing needs for the family that it just gets, you know, to the bottom of the list. Um, but as soon as you can is always my question. But okay. it also depends on the goal. It depends on the goal, right? If they're going to live in an expat community and they're really just going to be in a bubble, maybe it's not as as big of a thing if they're going to be working in the local language extensively. So I always ask that of clients first. Tell me your goal okay. first and I'll tell you how to reach them. So when you say, uh, when when you notice that they are going to live in a bubble, that that gets all my my the 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 hair and the and my neck standing up. Um, and I, I know I'm opinionated about this. So when when you when you recognize this in future expats that they that their plans or their intentions are to uh, stay amongst their cultural peers and not venture out, um, is is that something? that makes you work harder because if you're trying to teach them something new that would help them break out of the bubble, is there, is there resistance? Oh, incredible <laughs> resistance. <laughs> Absolutely. I'll, I'll quote one of my, um, we had a Korean client, uh, a company and every time at lunch, we tell them, you know, you can get a free English lesson. If you sit with your American colleagues at lunch, you know, you can get all the idioms and the regular speech and, you know, and it's free. And he said, I speak English all day at lunch. I just want to rest. <laughs> <laughs> and he, you know, so we go into that corporate lunchroom and we see all the Koreans together, all the Americans together, you know, And so um, there's huge resistance, you know? And after, after years, I'll ask families, you know, they're leaving now, three years in the US or three years in Russia, wherever it is, you know, did you make any Russian friends there? Or did you make any American friends here? And they're like, they just stuck with their own. It's, mm. it's hard, it's human nature, but yeah. we do, that's, that's one of the assimilation sides of our language training. We actually added a little thing over the last two months, language training and assimilation. Mm. And we're really, really pushing that as 25% of our program, which is that, you know, pushing them to eat lunch, pushing them to join the PTA. Now, this mm. is just an American example, but get involved, basically. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, what, what would be another example, PTA? Brett, what can you think of Cricket Club or what else will we do to, <laughs> to, to involve people abroad? Absolutely. I mean, oftentimes I will suggest uh, if if they follow a faith, if they have a faith practice, um, a church is usually a good place to start because you're getting involved and um, you're you're actively engaging with people that maybe speak the local language, and um, you know you've got a space there that's kind of familiar to you. If you if you have you have the familiarity of the faith practice, but you have also the the to expand it into the language as well. That's another place I would suggest as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great example, great suggestion. So Micah, how, how do you administer um, language education to adults, to professionals who have hectic um, day to days and who are under the additional pressure of getting ready for, or being in the middle of a, of a global work project? How, how, how do you as a service provider 
um, make them to commit? What, what can you do? I think that's a really, really good question. And it's interesting that you ask that because I always say the schedule is the reason the program will be successful or not because people are so busy, you know? Mm -hmm. They're they're trying to nurture their 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 partnerships, you know, with their loved ones, they're being a dad or a mom. I mean, these are huge huge roles in our lives, you know, learning Russian obviously does not come before being a, a mom or a dad or a partner. Right. And so what I usually try to do and our project managers are trained in the same way we really get to know their daily life before anything starts, before we choose an instructor, before we do anything. And, you know, we kind of walk through it, you know, do you go to the gym in the mornings? Um, do you have a baby you're up with in the middle of the night was one of our questions lately. Um, uh -huh. so we're trying to find that perfect time of day where they're not going to have to cancel. We know that cancellations and life comes up, but can we find that time of day where it's the very least, you know, right. where it's maybe just once a month? And so a lot of people will will try to ask for, you know, like two o'clock, three o'clock. And in our experiences, that is the most cancelable. <laughs> That's not a word, but it's it's the time when meetings come up the most and they have right. to do their job. And so right. a lot of people <clears throat> counseling them to to do six, six thirty, and seven, because who's going to ask them for a 6:30 meeting and then it's done it's over with you know and they've and they've committed like you said and so our our success rate really depends on that amazing schedule yeah yeah i i um, or they might have they they may have a cultural trainer going to be there with them all day because this this often happens if they my clients will say well after you leave I've got language training I've got a training and I kind of say well if you'd have told me that I probably would have told you not to do it because I think they think that sitting sitting all day with someone like me is going to be kind of like an easy process and we actually get into some really emotional and 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 yeah. and stressful things so at the end of the day then to turn up and have to work with a language trainer can be tough. And I've worked, I've actually worked with people that do our work that are language trainers and they, they suggest this and they say, you know, there's, there, there, you've got to schedule this. This is an intentional thing where you have to be really present and mind and body. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. Is there a way or have you found a, a good technique to enroll the employers um, in the scheduling process to make them your ally? After all, they hire you to do this. Um, it, I mean, obviously not every, not every corporation is the same, uh, same with us, Brett and I, we, we recognize this with different um, attitudes towards the work we do, cultural training. But I noticed some, sometimes you can um, forge a relationship with the employer that that helps you um, create a, a context for everyone involved that um, makes it basically non-negotiable that the language instruction will be done and you will schedule it and it's part of our plan. I think communication and agreement from the get-go of any program with everyone involved in the program and those working with anyone involved in the program, having that understanding from the very beginning is crucial. When we're working with HR or the learning and development teams for this exact reasons, we request, hey, we would love to have a basic agreement in place that understands that you know, if someone has a language training, can we really be mindful of that? and put that as a priority. And so our first couple of years in business, we saw that people were, you know, having to cancel a lot. And so we started uh, requesting that from the beginning. And that's all it takes, you know, and understanding right. and communication, because the employees are always going to run to their meeting. They're always going to cancel because they don't want to let their employer down, right? Right. But if we have this understanding, they are let off the hook that, yes, we do believe in language and we need that. Because if you don't <laughs> support the programs you're paying for as an employer, it's it's a little miss. Uh, it's it's confusing, right? As an employee. I, I would agree. How do you how, how has the, the pandemic changed the way you go about the 
the language instruction. I know that you did a lot of one-on-one -on -one in person in the past, but yeah. you've always done your organization has always done virtual um, lessons as well. So how how big of a pivot did you have to complete? Yeah, so I would say before the pandemic, we were about 2% online and 98% in person globally. Um, so our instructors are, you know, going to people's offices in Tokyo, Lithuania, Paris, you name it. And in about 24 hours, um, as everything was going down, uh, we sent a mass email to, to all of the instructors and said, we're going online, you know, make it work. The way, to, the way to do this quickly, you know, the way to turn on a dime is for each of you to find the platform that works best for each of you so that we don't feel this huge difference because they can't just suddenly have a week without pay, you know, with, while we're figuring things out, that's not fair either. And so now we are 98% online and 2% in person. Some people are, are choosing to try that out. Very, very small groups and one-on-one -on -one people with their teachers. So that's that's been very interesting, but everyone moved very quickly. I was um, pleasantly surprised. I'm happy to hear that. Yeah, Brett, no, I, I, it was I, same, same thing happening on your face. I'm sorry? I see a question forming on your face. No, it's a well. I, no, just a comment. Just a, obviously, the same thing happened in our work, and people had to adapt very quickly. Yeah. And then that brings in a whole set of other mental challenges uh, that everybody, your clients included, are also in this um, situation. And then, of course, maybe it adds another part to the language part. Maybe you're learning a part of the language that you need to show empathy with, you know, and and these kind of things. These are these would probably, and I'm, I know I'm getting down to the nuts and bolts of what you learn, how you learn it, what words mm -hmm. to learn, right? Yes, you can order a beer and a sandwich, but when it gets down to actually having maybe a, a, a an inviting conversation with somebody who doesn't speak a, a I mean, it may, they may speak English, but you want to generously show that you're trying mm -hmm. and then to, to, to get back to empathetic words. So I guess that, that would be my question then. What, what do you say to people when they're just starting? What do, would they learn first? What's the basics? Um, is, it, is it actual? Because I've learned another language, so I'm, I'm interested in the approach. My approach was sure. to learn the sounds because... It was forming the uh, forming the letters or the sounds of the letters because my the language I speak is this one, <laughs> right? So uh, I have to. Uh, <laughs> I say have it to, out loud. What is it? What did it say? This one. Yeah. Uh, wow. So this is um, the, these the, these are the, these are this is completely foreign to my tongue, right? So mm -hmm. you have. Um, you have a language that has to sound differently. Mm -hmm. So these are the formations of words. So how much, apart from the words and the and the and the spelling and, and the grammar, how much you get into actually trying to practice the mouthing and the sounds of the of the of the words and the letters? That's what I'm interested in. So that's a really great question. So I won't tell the whole story, but basically I had been in Japanese classes as a young person between 15 and 22. I had been in two semesters of Japanese at Boston University. I had been in uh, three semesters of French and eight semesters of Spanish. And I couldn't say anything. And I was irate at the level I had gotten to. And what does any good little entrepreneur do when she's mad about a product? Makes a better one. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and so I started trying to figure out why did this fail? This is crazy. My grandmother spoke five languages. How in the world was I supposed to follow her footsteps if I had been in over 15 <laughs> semesters of these classes and I had gotten nowhere? And don't get me wrong, I could say some stuff. But when I took a, a job in Mexico, I couldn't talk with my coworkers. I couldn't make friends. I mean, I was very stunted, which shouldn't have been. And so, Long story short, over the next three years, I started taking on clients and formulating the Bellu method, which we have trademarked 
And it's all about relevancy. And so the first couple of classes with us, we're asking you, what exactly do you need? What are you using this for? And then just like you said, Brett, we're starting with speaking, 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 listening, listening, listening from day one. Because no matter where you're at, the boardroom or the grocery store, no one's going to slip you a note to talk with you. <laughs> because everything focuses on writing and reading. And, you know, I just had a progress from meeting with the Japanese client yesterday. And, you know, he had said to me, oh, I thought we were going to have a book. I want a book. I said, why do you want a book? Let me, I'm going to push you. Why do you want a book? He said, well, I said, do you want a book? Because you've always had a book. And he right. said, he said, hmm. Maybe. He does a, <clears throat> yes, I think you're right. I said, do you want a book because you don't want to do the podcasts and the TV and the listening exercises that we're telling you to do? He said, hmm, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, books are safe. Books are what we know. Let's fill in the grammar blanks. Let's conjugate the verbs, you know? Mm -hmm. But that does not a conversation make. <laughs> Right. That is not understanding a conference call when everyone has their videos off. Exactly. That's painful. And so with the Bellu method, it's all about relevancy, relevancy. What are you going to be doing with this language? Let's build something exactly for you. And then 99%, of course, if you need help with a presentation and you have to write something, we'll help you writing something. But 99% is what Brad said. We've got to understand the sounds, really hear the sounds, and start from just like we learned our first language. That's how we learned our first language. No one wrote yeah. to a two-year-old, you know? So no, I don't remember getting getting written notes. No, I don't remember. Exactly. That. When, you, when you were two? You were totally fluent by five. Well, but in first grade, I got this, I got the notes slipped to me. Um do you want to go with me? Yes, no. Check the box. Yes, no. Let me think about yeah, it. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. I got yeah. those notes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the other, the other, um, the other strategy might be what do what I do. Uh, produce a human being that speaks uh, the other language fluently and is uh, up, up, uh, uh, is brought up with it. So my ten-year-old right. speaks both languages like a native. And she just came back from Poland, and uh, the, the, even though she was born in the U.S. Yeah. And, uh, and and has learned her Polish here, she has no American accent in Polish, no, and of all the local people. So it really is, and it and it is very humbling as a father to have a ten-year-old walk around and correct you with everything you say every day, and you know, with grammar and spelling and pronunciation. Same so that's a good way to do it. That, that'll that'll Absolutely. force her to do it. She didn't have to learn it; she absoaborbed it. She, she soaked it. Yeah. it up. She just lived. She just lived it, and that's she that's just lived it exactly. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. what I want for my kid. That's right. <laughs> 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 All right. That's my goal. <laughs> let let this be the message for the weekend. Learn the languages as many as you possibly can. They're a window to other worlds. They're to windows to understanding the mindset and the philosophy and the worldviews of those that cohabitate this beautiful planet of ours. So as many languages that you can get your fingers and your tongue and your ears into, the better it might be. Micah, thank you for taking time this Friday morning. Thank Thanks you. for watching, everybody. Two Japs, many cultures, 70 episodes. Can you believe it? We'll wow. see you again next week. Oh, wow. Thanks, Micah. Have a great weekend. Bye, Bye. Brett. Bye, guys.